And um, I've had the privilege of working for Young Passion for three years next month. Uh, started about eight months before the pandemic. Um, and what fun that's been uh, for a couple of years. But, um, you know, God's good and um, God's heart is to serve the poor. And Compassion's heart is to enable um, some of the poorest communities around the world. Um, we're able to serve those because of churches like yourselves are able to engage with us, be generous in their prayers, in their giving, and uh, really see lives transformed. And so this morning, I just want to do a number of things. The first thing is, is to just give you a PowerPoint presentation update on the impact that is being had by um, the children that are being supported and served here from the church. And then also, there's a number of those children which are from a particular country, so we're going to have an update from that country in how they've responded through the pandemic to continue to be able to serve the children, even though projects and churches were closed um, very much like they were here. So the, the presentation really is just going to give us an idea of... Um, No, I think we're okay on everything that I'm going to share today to be recorded, so... All right, brilliant. So hopefully this remote will work. Oh, there we go. So, um, so the difference that's being made through the church here is, um, you know, through the children that are being sponsored. I think we've got them. Here we go. Um, there's almost 7,000 um, hours from the children that have been spent at the projects. The children that are sponsored... Um, in the compassion programs they attend a project every single Saturday and during their time there they'll receive nutritional meals which will hopefully continue to help them be healthy physically as we don't know what they're eating during the week some families that we're serving and um, they don't know where the next meal is coming from so we're able to give nutritional meals at these projects during that time and there's been almost 3,000 nutritional meals given so for us, it's not just about serving these children spiritually, it's serving them holistically through meeting their spiritual um, needs, their practical needs, their physical needs, their relational needs. And, um, and um, you know, during, during their time with us at Compassion, each child every year will have an annual um, medical checkup. So there's been 39 medical checkups um, from visiting doctors and if either, any of these children um, that are sponsored with compassion um, become ill at any point, whether it's diarrhea or malaria or something that may need um, surgery, then compassion intervene and make sure that we're able to help that child and see them become healthy um, through the other side of their illness. And also each project that we are engaged with are based at local churches so the children get to hear about the gospel of jesus and we're able to give out bibles too so there's 20 bibles that have been given out to these children and their families so that they can engage in the word of god which is tremendous over the past 12 months there's been just over five thousand pounds given and there's been eight additional gifts given on top of the sponsorship too. So people are obviously given for birthdays or Christmas, sending gifts to either the child or their families. And, um, and when gifts are given, we don't just give that money to the families or the child um, for them to do whatever they want with it. One of our workers will sit down with those families and say, what is the need right now? So that money which has been generously given by yourselves is really used um, well and to maximize the impact within the season that it's being given. Five thousand pounds is a significant amount of money, isn't it? So generous and we deeply appreciate your giving. Um, as many of you know through the sponsorship there's opportunities to write to the children and for the children to write to you and there's been 21 letters being sent by the children and 21 letters being sent by sponsors this, this last 12 months which is great. Um, we do know that sometimes the letter writing can be a challenge from countries and, and some people aren't great at writing. I'm not a brilliant writer myself, to be honest. I'm always challenged when I'm talking about letter writing to, um, to, to groups of people like yourself to, to, to write more to, to the children because it does really engage and impact their lives. But uh, thank you for those of you that are engaging in the letter writing. 
And you can just see the dynamics here that there's 10 children, uh, 13 children, sorry, uh, that are sponsored, 10 girls and 13 boys. And there you can see the ages which um, sponsored at the moment. And they're the beautiful faces of the children that um, are being sponsored from the church here. If you're here this morning and you do sponsor a child with compassion and you can't see your child's face on there, then that means that your child isn't linked to this church. So after the service is finished, if you want to come and see myself, just at the back where there's a table, and we can just take your name and your postcode and we can link your child to the church here. So in the future, your child can be included in a presentation like this. And then there's, as I say, 13 children being sponsored. Those are the countries that are being engaged with at the moment, five countries, but there's nine that are being sponsored in Sri Lanka, which is I know is a particular focus for the church here. Just for those of you that may not be aware, um, Compassion UK is part of Compassion International. And we're one of 14 what we call donor countries, which raise finances and supports um, the countries that we are working in. And we're currently working in 25, uh, no, sorry, 26 countries, because we're just launching in Zambia, actually. We work in 26 countries in Asia, um, Africa, and Central and South America. And, um, and at the moment, we've got 2.2 million children that are being supported through the direct generosity of the church globally, which is phenomenal, isn't it? But the reality is this, that there's over 375 million children living in abject extreme poverty that means that they're part of a family that surviving on less than one pound 48 a day so we're really serving the poorest of the poor through people like yourselves that's just a little bit of an update on the covid response uh, percentages um, globally and we'll hear more a little bit about that from our focus in sri lanka in a few moments time they're just some images of some of the neighborhoods that um, these children live in uh, along with their families, uh, churches that are partnering with us. As I mentioned earlier, that um, each child that's sponsored is connected to a local church. We, we are great believers in the local church. It's God's hope for the world, isn't it? And at the moment, we've got over 8,000 church partners which serve and work with us in serving these, um, well, 2.2 million children at the moment. I'll skip that um, quickly, but it's just the story of a graduate, um, really. We've got uh, over 1 million graduates from our programs um, in the, the 70 years that we've existed as a charity. So it just leads me to say a huge thank you to you uh, for engaging with us, for being our neighbours, our co-workers in the gospel, in serving the poor, uh, which is a tremendous privilege, isn't it? Um, so, um, just to, to, to let you know that um, for those of you that may not be aware, we do have a Compassion app. Um, if you're engaged in sponsoring, this really helps me keep an update on my child that I'm sponsoring, but um, they can be downloaded onto your phone. If you need some more information about this, then come and see me afterwards. It does really um, help you engage um, with um, all that's going on with compassion, but particularly with the child that you're sponsoring too. So just to give you an update um, globally um, with the COVID response, uh, before we look at the focus on Sri Lanka, um, in the first 10 months of the pandemic, which I know seems quite a while ago now, doesn't it? But in the first 10 months of the pandemic, we had to just change the way that we worked. Because as you were, have already realized that every child that is served is connected to a local church and attends a program. And because churches and the programs were closed predominantly around the world, then we had to look at working differently. And um, just during those first 10 months, the Compassion staff and volunteers within all of the countries that we worked in were able to give out 10 and a half million food packs to families. And those food packs didn't just last them for one or two days. There were enough food to last them a month. And so they just visited every home where we're serving and was able just to support those families that um, had lost jobs, who were unable to work, and really just had no choice of getting food from anywhere apart from ourselves. So that was quite an amazing opportunity for us just to engage with 
serving them practically as a family to ensure that they had food to eat. We also was able to give out hygiene kits um, just to help, again, families to be able to look after themselves um, physically and to be able to have a wash, clean their teeth, um, sanitary items, all those kind of things. And we was able to give out over 7 million packs to the families that we work with. We was also able to give out almost 1 million medical kits, which were just able to help families that were on medication, needed some help medically within that season. And in some of the countries, um, the most practical thing to do, and even though it wasn't really one of our policies to, to, to ever engage in this, um, we, we just gave out cash to families because that was the most practical thing that would help them in that moment. And so we gave out £330,000 during that 10 months just to give families cash in their hands where they were able to just go and buy food and help them in the desperate situation that they found themselves in. So why don't we just take a look now at the video of just an update from Sri Lanka and how they were just engaging with their families during the pandemic. Greeting from Sri Lanka. I am Krishna and I am seven years old. from Sri Lanka. I am Krishan and I am seven years old. Hi to everyone, greetings from Sri Lanka. As we all know, the COVID pandemic has caused much hardship, particularly to our beneficiaries. We have about 15,000 beneficiaries in Sri Lanka. COVID has made them confined to four walls, also, they are very, very vulnerable for the parents have lost their jobs. Children haven't been able to access education. Greeting from Sri Lanka. I am Krishan and I am seven years old. Hi to everyone. Greetings from Sri Lanka. As we all know, the COVID pandemic has caused much hardship, particularly to our beneficiaries. We have about 15,000 beneficiaries in Sri Lanka. COVID has made them confined to four walls. Also, they are very, very vulnerable for the parents have lost their jobs. Children haven't been able to access education because schools are still not open, which have been closed for many months. The children are unable to cope with the sudden challenge. Compassion took a quick decision to provide their support to alleviate the poverty of children and the families. We were able to provide dry rations to fulfill their food needs. They provided hygienic items like masks to help children and families protect themselves. At that moment, when they have a need, Compassion was able to help them. They are not alone. There is someone to help them, someone to care for them, and their depression levels did not go very low. It made them boost to come out of the situation. So I want to share with you about a beneficiary from one of our projects. He joined in 2015 very difficult life because his mother was very ill but the father was in prison he had nothing to look forward to but the project helped 
got involved in his life and through one of our income generation programs we were able to buy some goats in July and then in October the goats produced calves and then they were able to sell and also help another family with some of the baby goats and they are today very much appreciated and thank for what they have done to the society i believe in all circumstances god is working in and through you god is using you and we were able to support the community through you children need your prayers so please pray for them so that they will be safe they will be protected and we will be able to provide the assistance that they need thank you my dear sponsor for all that you do i love my sponsor and i pray for her every day thank you beautiful isn't it and uh, what i love about the countries where we have the opportunity to serve is that they're very innovative just the story there of the family this young man in a desperate situation but there was able to buy goats and um, it was just able to help them practically in that moment but then it was able to help another family and there's so much of that that goes on um it's just phenomenal so anthony who was the country director there they really are heroes they're doing an unbelievable work they're trusting god in some of the most desperate situations and i was just talking to elaine before the service and the 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 the, the child that they sponsor in sri lanka their their home was lost because of the floods um, and so there's these moments in time where we just have to rally around and rebuild homes and just support families and um, you know serving the poor is an absolute privilege and we're able to do that because of people like yourself so thank you again for everything that you're doing in standing alongside us in serving god's heart for the poor just want to spend a few moments in god's word and just encourage us and maybe challenge us this morning as we just um consider um a moment in god's story where jesus encountered um, blind Bartimaeus and blind Bartimaeus encountered him and uh, there's just a few verses I want to read from Mark chapter 10 verses 46 to 52 so if you've got your Bibles with you and you want to follow them please do it says then they came to Jericho as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city a blind man Bartimaeus, that is the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me jesus stopped and said call him so they called to the blind man cheer up on your feet he's calling you throwing his cloak aside he jumped to his feet and came to jesus what do you want me to do for you jesus asked him the blind man said rabbi i want to see Go, Jesus said, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. What I love about this encounter, and it's just like so many other encounters in the Bible, is that there's so much more in this story than just the miracle of blind Bartimaeus receiving his sight. And I don't know if there's moments in your lives as you've looked back in your story with god that you think wow that was a significant moment for me and i remember when i was uh, a young nine uh, naive 16 year old boy who um, loved god and decided to go on a mission my very first mission to london um, short-term mission it was for a week 
and I went with YWAM. And we were working with the ICFIS Fellowship. And it was back in the day where you used to wear shell suits. Can you, can you remember the shell suits in the 80s? And uh, we used to do like these open air um, outreaches. And um, most days we would go to Leicester Square. And um, for those of you that have been to London, been to Leicester Square, you know that they're very busy places. And we used to set up and we used to do um, some songs. We used to do some dramas and some dances. Um, if you could not imagine me dancing for a moment, that would be wonderful. <laughs> and uh, we used to share our stories. And uh, we used to get crowds of people, you know, three or 400 people a day, just to stop and, and listen to us. And we used to ask for a response. And after a couple of days, I noticed there was this guy um, just standing to the side of us with a long green trench coat and this top hat. And I just um, went over one one, um, I think it was on a morning actually, and just introduced myself. And this guy, his name was Clint, and he'd been on the streets for 25 years. And we just sat down on the roadside, very much like this story here of Blind Bartimaeus, and began to chat with him, and he was sharing his story, and you know, he was asking me about our faith and about Jesus and what we were sharing. And um, this went on for a couple of days, and, and about the, th the third or fourth day, I just said, hey, Clint, can I take you out for dinner? And uh, there was a Burger King just across the other side of Leicester Square. So we went and had a greasy burger and some fries and a thick shake. And we just sat and chatted. And he asked me if I could pray for him. And in that moment in Burger King, I was able to lead this guy to Jesus. And every day at this outreach, one of the leaders would ask at the end of the day, is there anything any of us have got to share? And I remember Clint was just at the back of the group and he put his hand up and he said, I've got something to say. And this guy pointed at him and he said, you've got nothing to say. Now, if I'm going to be totally honest with you this morning, this 16 year old boy wanted to punch this guy's lights out. I was so angry because I thought this guy's got everything to say. He's got as much right to say something as anybody else within this group. And Clint walked off and he went to this dustbin where about 30 minutes previously, he'd put a bottle of whiskey. He got his bottle and he just walked off. And I was a broken 16 year old kid. But as I look back on that story, this moment, I know that that was significant in my life's journey and what God had got for my life and actually why I'm doing what I'm doing today speaking on behalf of those that don't have a voice in encouraging God's people to look out and serve the poor and those that are marginalized and in need. And in this story right here, we see blind Bartimaeus on the roadside begging, one of the least of those in Jericho within his community. He'd been there for a number of years with his friends and he'd go there every morning and he'd get his cloak and he'd put it out in front of him. And that was the place where people used to put their gifts and what they wanted to give them. And he heard Jesus was in town. And he knew this moment was a moment where he could receive a miracle that he'd been waiting for for some time. And the wonderful thing I love about blind Bartimaeus is here's this guy who was often ignored by many in his community. In fact, it says in this portion of scripture that the people that were following Jesus as he walked down the street teaching about the kingdom of God. So these disciples would have been there. People who loved God would have been there. People who were interested in what Jesus had to say would have been there. And they told him to be quiet. This story tells me that even though blind Bartimaeus was someone that didn't have anything really, and was often ignored by his community, he had a revelation of who God was because he called him son of David, which means Messiah. And what I love about this story, it doesn't matter about our background, our upbringing, where we've come from, what we've done. God can reveal himself to anybody on this planet. And he'd revealed himself to blind Bartimaeus. Also, blind Bartimaeus showed some resilience that he didn't care that this group of people was telling him to shut up. 
He called all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. Trying to get the attention of Jesus. And the crowd told him to be quiet. But he didn't care. He had this resilience. And, you know, sometimes in our lives, we have moments that are really tough, that are really challenging, that are really difficult. And I don't know what it's like to live on the streets. I can only imagine the pain, the loneliness, the suffering. Why these guys like Clint all those years ago had a bottle of whiskey. Well, it would probably warm him up. It would probably help him sleep through those cold winter nights. And often we can look at these people, can't we? And we can be judgmental. But we don't know their story. We don't know why they ended up in this place of poverty and desperateness. And it's the same here for blind Bartimaeus. But he had this resilience, which actually can teach us something, can't it? That when things are tough for us, and things have never been that tough for me, that actually resilience is a powerful thing that can help us push through to receive that very thing that God has for us. So blind Bartimaeus has this revelation of who God is. He has this resilience. He's not going to give up. He wants to get in front of Jesus, and he will do whatever he needs to do. But he also has this reliance, this, this faith to know that, actually, if I can get in front of Jesus, I can receive my sight. I can see. There's this moment in the scriptures here where it says he threw his cloak aside and he approached Jesus. You know, the cloak, as I've already said, was the most precious thing to a beggar in those days because they would just feel where the cloak was and gather those four corners of the cloak and lift it up and carry away whatever they'd received during that day. But blind Bartimaeus, as he's throwing this cloak aside, shows me that he has incredible faith to believe that he's never going to need that cloak again. That in this moment he's going to get in front of Jesus, he will see and he will never need his cloak. What an incredible act of faith. I don't know what you're believing for today. I don't know what miracle you need in your life right now. But all we need is faith, the size of a mustard seed, to believe that God is and will be enough for us and will come through in time. Blind Bartimaeus is a great example to us this morning. Knowing that God can reveal himself to us. We're strong enough and have faith to keep on pushing through and believing that we can see that miracle that we're believing for, that breakthrough that we're believing for can come to us. The other thing I want us just to take a moment and have a look at is what Jesus actually did in that moment. Verse 49, it says that Jesus stopped. Here was a man who was very popular. He was followed by a lot of people. And in this moment, he's, as he was teaching and walking through the streets, as many rabbis did back in those times, he was actually on his way out of Jericho. He was going to Jerusalem, which was about a 17-mile walk to celebrate the Passover with his disciples and then give himself sacrifice for you and for me, for every human being that has ever walked the face of this earth. Jesus was busy teaching. He was surrounded by these crowds and there was this hustle and bustle, but he heard the cry of the blind man and he stopped. And when Jesus stopped, he asked those guys around him to call him. And the rhetoric of that crowd changed from shut up to cheer up to get up. And he approached Jesus. And I've read this scripture 
thousands of times and I always used to think why didn't Jesus just go across the blind by Timaeus why didn't why didn't why did he ask him to come to him and it's the fact that so often when we need Jesus in our lives he wants us to make a step towards him that step of faith that step of belief and as Jesus stopped and called him blind Bartimaeus got in front of him and Jesus asked this bizarre question what can I do for you we all know don't we that Jesus knew exactly what blind Bartimaeus wanted but what did Jesus want from blind Bartimaeus he didn't want him to just to step forward he wanted him to confess with his own words that he wanted to receive his sight and the most amazing thing that it never mentions about Jesus praying for him he just says your faith's healed you go you've received your sight incredible isn't it but Jesus stopped for blind Bartimaeus and Jesus stood alongside blind Bartimaeus and Jesus set blind Bartimaeus free and Jesus sent him into the future that he deserved this is right at the end of these few verses that he followed Jesus along the road and I do wonder whether blind Bartimaeus was there in that moment when Jesus hung on the cross those days later but there's some great lessons here for us from blind Bartimaeus but also in the actions of Jesus the Son of God in God's heart for the poor in how we need to approach and be there for the poor and often in the business of our lives we can ignore people can't we and um, I'm very aware that when I go into the city of Bristol there's a number of people that are on the streets homeless they have a cup in front of them or a tin and they ask for money and 99% of the time I haven't got money I don't carry cash you know I've just got Apple pay on my phone basically and I keep trying to remind myself when I go into the city to take some cash so I can actually give something to somebody but what I do do is make sure I always acknowledge them that I never ignore them and just say I'm really sorry I've got no cash today and sometimes I will stop and chat with them because I know that makes them feel better it makes them feel that they've got worth when someone actually acknowledges them and I want to encourage you today I don't know what the homeless demographics are here in Weymouth or maybe Dorchester just up the road but if you ever see someone on the streets and if you've got some cash then and do give if you haven't then acknowledge them at least because God's heart is to always stop and to serve the poor in some way whether that's through encouragement, whether it's through offering to pray for them, or it's through them giving them some money, or going to McDonald's and buying them a meal, or to Sainsbury's local and getting them a meal deal, you know, whatever it is. But you know, I just think let's be aware of those that are around in a, around us. And I know as a church, uh, just from the conversations with some of you here this morning, that you're engaging in your community, that you are serving through food bank and cap and all these wonderful wonderful things in serving those that are in need within your own local community but let's remember that there's always someone in need that's around us and just to be always aware of that and always ask the Holy Spirit of what he wants you to do for them in that moment you know in a in a moment I'm going to just ask for those that aren't currently engaging with compassion um, and to give you an opportunity to to engage with us this morning uh, but before we do that i'd just like you to watch one more video um, it's called one day and it's a great encouragement to us to just see that for those of you that are engaging with us this morning um, you know sponsoring a child is for the long haul but it has a tremendous impact and transformation but just to think of that actually one day what is going to be happening to your child in this video just encourage us to think about that
sponsor had a great impact on me, on my development, because every time I go to school, every time I do something, I always think of them and I always make them proud. Yes, I always want to make my parents proud too, but there's another set of parents that I consider that I don't want to disappoint them. I see my sponsors, Betty and Boyd, as, as my family because that's how they treated me. They treated me as one of their sons. The first person that helped me believe that I could be a leader was my sponsor, who wrote me that letter and told me that they believed in me. And I thought to myself, if they believed in me and I was going to become somebody, it's true, I can actually become that somebody. They always encouraged me just to be a good student, a good daughter, and just to keep learning as much as I could because even though in my thoughts that maybe I would not be able to do much because I didn't have the resources, but they always put those words in my heart that I will have just a trust in God that He will He will He will open doors for me. I am what I am today because of a stranger willing to invest in my life and show me the, the love of Christ and pray for me and encourage me each step of the way. Fantastic. You know, I'm very much aware of the moments we're living in here in the UK and um, the cost of living is certainly increasing, isn't it? Times are getting even tight for many people here in the UK. And I just want to encourage you this morning, you know, as you continue to give and sponsor your child, um, you know, there's moments in our family's lives where we thought, wow, you know, things are a little bit tight right now. And, you know, that thought is coming to our mind of, Maybe we can't afford to sponsor this child anymore. But I've always been reminded that the children that are sponsored are in a far more difficult place than we are in the UK. And I just want to encourage you this morning, you know, even when it gets tight, just to keep pressing in, to keep believing that God can provide for you as you have that element of faith to keep giving into what you're giving into here within the context of the church here in Weymouth and what God's calling you to do here in this wonderful place, but also what God's doing around the world. And I love this scripture up here that you've got, you know, disciples of all nations, making disciples of all nations. For those of you that are sponsoring, you are making a disciple. In fact, you're making disciples because you're not just impacting that child's life, you're impacting the siblings and the parents. And disciple making is going on and you're, in, you're engaging in it through your sponsorship. But for those of you this morning that aren't engaging with us and maybe haven't um, sponsored a child up to this point, then I just want to encourage you to come and see me afterwards. I've got half a dozen profiles of beautiful children from Sri Lanka. You know, a place that's in real need right now. And um, I know this is a country that's on the heart of the church. And uh, this uh, young lady here, Hiruthi Asini, she turns five this coming Tuesday. It's going to be her fifth birthday. And she's looking for a sponsor along with another bunch of kids there. And, um, you know, if you're in a position this morning where you think that you can afford £28 a month to sponsor a child, which I know is a significant amount of money, but it does transform their lives and gives them a future that they would never have without our support not just financially, but relationally, and the fact that you're praying for them also. I'm going to be hanging around after the service. Come and chat with me, and um, it would be great if you can engage at that level with us this morning. If you do sponsor, come and say hello, and um, it'd be just great to chat with you. And like I said earlier on, if you have a child and it's not attached to this church, then come and give me your name, and we can make sure that that takes place too. But just to let you know that the £28 each month, 
you know, over 80% of that does go directly to the child. Um, it's about 88% actually. And um, the other 12% just goes to finding the next child. When you go to some of these places, uh, and I've had the privilege of going to Kenya and Ghana up to now, often they're in like a compound which has got a fence around it and there's always kids on the other side of the fence. It always breaks my heart because I want those kids to get on the right side of the fence so we can help them, we can support them, we can give them that future that they so much deserve. And so, um, so thank you as a church for being so generous in your giving. And can I just pray um, for a moment with you just before I hand back over to Mick. Father God, it is just such an honor and privilege to serve you. And even though in this life, things aren't always easy. We're always carrying the tension of a challenge or a difficult situation, which we're believing you to work in and break through in. And at the other side of that tension, there's things that are good and joyful and happy and great in our lives. And Lord, I just thank you that you're the God that stands alongside us in those great and happy and content moments. But also you're the God that stands alongside us and is with us in amongst those challenges and difficult circumstances in those valley experiences. And Lord, today I just want to thank you for every person in this place. For those people that are part of this beautiful community but that aren't able to be with us this morning. Lord, you know their needs. You know them just like you knew blind Bartimaeus. And you're able to stand alongside us, to support us and to set us free and send us into our futures. And Lord, whatever element of faith is needed this morning, I pray that each person would have the faith to believe that you are enough, you are their portion for what they're believing, either for themselves or for a, a loved one or for a friend. Lord, as we petition you, as we come to you, thank you that you can set us free, that you are the answer to our need. And Lord, for everything that Weymouth Family Church are engaging in within this town and beyond, in serving the poor, the marginalized, those that are in need, those that are yet to hear the gospel, Lord, I pray that you would continue to encourage them and to strengthen them, strengthen them as they serve you, that they are your hands, that they are your feet within this community. And Lord, we pray for those that are in need within Weymouth, that they would have a revelation that you are the son of David, that you are the Messiah, and that there's a group of people here waiting to love them, to serve them, to embrace them as being part of the church, your bride, a beautiful family. So Lord, have your way. We believe that the best days are ahead of us. And Lord, for those that are yet to return from this COVID season, Lord, stir their hearts to just come and embrace and be part of family again, to love and serve you with other disciples of Christ. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your grace for your mercy, for your love and commitment to us as your children. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Paul. Really stirring, wasn't it? Really challenging. Challenging to hear about the, uh, the kids, the families that are being sponsored. Challenging to hear about Bartimaeus. Challenging to hear about Clint. I found it all very challenging, and I uh, hope that you did too. Um, Paul, thank you. And it's, you know, it's actually so good just to be told, quite simply, by what we do, we make a difference.
I think sometimes we, we don't, you know, we, we kind of becomes automatic. Oh, we do it. It goes out of the bank account. Um, sometimes we remember to write. Um, sometimes we remember to pray. Um, you know, but actually what we do, thank you, Paul, you reminded us, it, it does make a difference. And that's, that's good to know. I believe the song next is Good Good Father, isn't it? I think that'd be a really good song to, to do, actually, because um, I think, you know, that we're talking about our father, you know, and um, not all of the kids that, that will be sponsored, not all of the kids that, that are being uh, supported will have necessarily a physical father in, in some cases, um, but actually that they've all got and their families have got a father in heaven that really loves them and really cares about them. So I think that'd be a really appropriate song to finish with. Okay, guys, thanks. Oh 
Father, that you are a good, good Father, and that whatever circumstance we find ourselves in, that we can come to you, we can turn to you, and you will wrap your arms around us, for you are perfect in all of your ways, and this love is so undeniable that you sent your Son to the cross for us, for every one of us, so that we can be made whole and true in you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for all you've done with us this morning and the, the, the messages that we can take away. And we ask that you help us grow in all these things, Lord, and be with us this week as we go forward into all those encounters you have planned for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen. Please take your seats. Um, oh. Just very briefly, um, for those that are interested in, in Farm Fest or still not quite sure what's happening, so the weekend that we're going to spay, uh, spend in Dorchester. Spend? No, I didn't say Spain. If you're going to Spain, you're going the wrong way, Mike. So the weekend we're going to spend in Dorchester. Uh, the Friday evening, there is um, no food planned, but there is a, um, a fire pit worship. For those that are camping, they'll be there. They'll turn up uh, Friday between f uh, from 4 o'clock onwards, I think. Um, and then there's fire pit worship session there. If you'd like to come along and worship, you're most welcome. The Saturday, you are most welcome to, if you're not camping there, to have your breakfast at home, come in, maybe bring a packed lunch. Or for those that don't bring a packed lunch, I'm going to try and get hold of a few uh, pot noodles because there will be coffee and tea-making facilities, so there is something to eat uh, if you want to come along and spend the day. Um, there'll be time to get together in the morning and there'll be various activities and things going on. And then in the evening, uh, there is a big meal uh, planned for everybody. And so we can take part in that and worship as well. And the Sunday as well, uh, you can take breakfast at home if you're, if you're not camping there. And then come spend the morning with us as we worship the Lord. And that's roughly the plan that we got. So if you're, if you're camping, I think you know the details. If you need any more, then by all means come speak to me. Uh, for those that are going uh, on a daily basis, uh, I think I've got most of your names. If anybody's not spoken to me yet, please give me your names. And if you'd like to um, pay your contribution at some point uh, that is convenient to yourselves, or if that's a, that's a problem, please also speak to me. But just so that as a church that we can then um, put that forward to Dorchester Family Church, who's controlling that because there are lots of expenses they've got to put together so uh, all the facilities they're putting on for us hope that was clear coffee and tea are served bless you